folks with the NASCAR gene, and there are folks with the racing gene. And I've got the racing gene, and it is a thrill for me to be up on stage with these gentlemen because they represent my favorite kind of short track racing. Because I'm an old Illinois redneck at heart, guys, so I love the short track beating and banging that you see on the dirt tracks all over the country. And one thing that I've noticed is when it comes to short track racing in this country, the dirt tracks are really understanding what it takes to put fannies in the stands and cars in through the back gate. Because when it comes to running a racetrack, especially a short track, it is about how you do in the back gate, how you do in the front gate. But with these gentlemen, when it comes to dirt track racing, and the reason that I love dirt track racing is that track is never the same each and every week. So we're gonna talk about track prep tonight as, or today as well. So let me introduce to you our panel. And again, we're staying in alphabetical order here, but it's a little tougher because they're all in the R's. Uh, Gary Risch is the general manager at Lernerville Speedway. There are tracks in this country that have great weekly programs. There are tracks that have great special big time event programs. Lernerville is one of those places that can do both. And I don't care what you race at Lernerville, it's always gonna be exciting racing. Whether it's those big old 410 wing sprints, it's gonna be some modifieds, whatever. Put anything out on Lernerville, you're gonna have a great show. In addition to his duties at Lernerville, Gary is also the Director of Operations for the World Racing Group's biggest events, including Super Dirt Week and the World Finals, just to mention a few. So Gary, welcome and thanks for joining us tonight. Dan Robinson in the middle is the General Manager at Lucas Oil Speedway. You got your start, I understand, at Wilmont? Wilmont is the track, or one of the tracks, that got me hooked with this racing affliction. Uh, going up to Wilmont is a trip and is a lot of fun. Uh, how many dirt tracks also have a drag boat lake and also do dirt pulling events on their property? Not many that have the drag boat lake, I would, uh, I would assume. But Lucas Oil Speedway has been called the diamond of dirt tracks, and for good reason. It's become one of the racers' favorite tracks in the Midwest, and a lot of that is thanks to Dan's leadership. And Brett Root, racing is in Brett's DNA. That's the only way to put it. Uh, the International Motor Contest Association, of which he is the president, is the oldest active auto racing sanctioning body in the United States. And I can tell you, as a fan who has seen all the different rule packages, and at our little LaSalle Speedway, we did an IMCA event this year, and it was the, one of the best races of the year. Always great when the Super Nationals come to town with the, the Hell Tour, but the IMCA rules put on a better show than their usual weekly show. And uh, I'm glad Tony's not here because he'd yell at me for that. But their fair and consistent rule package is the reason that weekly racing stays affordable for so many racers across the country. And I gotta tell you folks, the Super Nationals at Boone that IMCA runs every year, if it's not already on your bucket list as a racing fan, it better be. That is the best event when it comes to short track racing. So guys, we're gonna talk about the front gate, we're gonna talk about the back gate, and we're gonna talk about track prep, but we're gonna start out at the front gate. And Gary, I'm just gonna to toss this one out to you because every time I've gone to Lernerville, it's been packed. So what's working to bring in the fans nowadays? Uh, we're lucky to be in a market that, uh, we're lucky and unlucky. I mean, we have these, the, these other little sporting teams in, in town like the Pittsburgh Steelers and uh, Penguins and stuff like that that we fight with, uh, with, with with marketing dollars and with fans, but luckily the, the, they, they transfer over a lot. And the front gate at Lernerville, we are the only track in the country that can run the top three divisions plus stock cars every week. Um, and it's because of our fan base. Uh, we, we rely on a front gate crowd every night to, uh, 
to be successful. And it takes a lot of hand-in-hand -hand, um, combat, is what we say, um, of getting the information into the, into, the, uh, into the customer's hands at other events. And, and like, like you said, you know, Lernerville has been in my blood. I've grew up there all my life. But it's uh, World Racing Group's given me the opportunity to travel the country and see a lot of different racetracks and events and stuff like that. Uh, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm really lucky with what I have and what I what, what the history of Lernerville is. And and but there is there is times where front gate and back gate means difference at Lernerville. Um, we've 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 had a thing called hangover events that that we came up with a few years ago. We we do have the Firecracker 100 and World of Outlaw Sprint Car races, and uh, realize that hey, we take all these all these guys' money for these big events. We got to find a way the next week to break it down for them and make it affordable for them to still come back and see a quality show, but not have a $22,000 purse. So um, it's, it's, it's a balance. You have, to, you have to section your schedule off in, uh, in I, I do mine three sections and try to uh, understand your area and what you got going around, on around you and do your best to take a shot at it. Dan? You know, our facility is in its 10th year now uh, in Wheatland, Missouri, and it's a very remote location. Um, not very remote, uh, but it's an hour from, say, Springfield, which is the biggest city. So our challenge has always been to reach those people and get them to, to leave Springfield where there is uh, Springfield Cardinal Minor League Baseball and those sorts of things. Uh, the one thing we found that really works well for us is, is a ton of diversity. We have 28 events and every night something different. I may have 12 weekly shows, but they're never titled the same. The ticket price is never the same. The entertainment's not always the same. Um, so we really try to balance it with that. And we don't run too many weekly shows. We, we run two at a time, and then the third week, say we might have a monster truck show. We might have Lucas Oil Light Malls, ASCS Sprint Cars. We just constantly keep things going. Um, and, and the other thing I've really done too, you know, we do a lot of social media like everything, but I, I've partnered with our TV stations in Springfield, uh, which is our closest big market. And the biggest thing for me was just a, I had to get in the conversation with those people. And so I paid direct advertising for our 12 special events. But to get our business, we basically made them promote or sponsor one of our weekly shows. So every night we might have uh, the NBC affiliate or the ABC affiliate, and they, they bring their, their TV uh, news people and different things up. So they come up and, and they get to see what a place it is. And it is a beautiful place. It's very overbuilt for some of what we do, but, but that has really helped to get those people uh, to get us in the conversation. And that's been one of the biggest things we've done. Brett, how many tracks are running IMCA rules now? There's gotta be a ton of them. Yeah, this year we had 200 and right at 207. What tracks. are you hearing from your member tracks for lack of a better term for it? that's working to, to bring in the fans? Uh, creativity, I think, is a lot of it. The, the, the different events that, that the facilities that we're sanctioning, it isn't just the actual auto racing and the you know, cars going in circles and, and whatnot that they're focusing on. They're doing um, promotional stuff with, within their community, all kinds of um, different things, um, special nights and whatnot that are helping pull fans in. Um, you know, the pure race fans, I think, are always gonna come. They, you know, I don't think that the tracks are necessarily too concerned about them or losing them. I think they're more concerned about you know, the casual fans that are being pulled in all kinds of different directions at different venues doing different things from, you know, obviously baseball, uh, football, soccer, any of those other things they may be going to. So, um, yeah, I mean, creativity has been probably the thing that I think that our most successful, successful racetracks are doing. And then they're just, you know, from a racing standpoint, from our standpoint, they're, they're doing a good job at the, at the races as well. One of the things I've heard from a lot of short track promoters across the country is that they sort of did get lazy on the front gate, assuming people would show up to watch anything, you know, eight train monkeys and, you know, on Hot Wheels cars, you know, whatever. Um, but they're doing a better balance now of attracting the front gate, make sure they keep the racers happy out the back gate. So we're going to try to give equal time here as well and keep the discussion balanced. So when it comes to the back gate, what racers always tell me is rules cost money and constantly changing the rules will kill a guy, but you have to keep the racing competitive. Again, Gary, you've got the, 
the luxury of running all those big series that cost a lot of money, but if you don't keep the playing field fair, you know, those racers will spend themselves into oblivion, then you won't have a show. How do you keep the racers happy, but keep the racing competitive? It's impossible. <laughs> Absolutely impossible. Uh, I'm lucky to have the uh, work for WRG and the role packages they have for the big classes, the 410 sprints, the super late models, and the big block modifieds. So I'm lucky to have those three classes with a standard set of rules, kind of like Brett has with his stuff. But when it comes down to the, our stock cars, which everybody in the world knows every stock car has a different rule for, for everything. And I tried to implement, well, I did implement, um, with major pushback was the crate motor program in the, into my stock cars this year. And, uh, geez, oh, man, I had people on Facebook want me to <laughs> die by the river and all kind of crazy <laughs> stuff. But, I mean, you got to stick to your goals, and rules do cost money, but not having rules costs more money. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I got with the motor builders, and they're, and they're, they're building $15,000 motors for, for $350 to win races. And... Uh, and everybody's like, wow, the car counts used to be 30 cars. Why are they 18? Well, I wonder why, guys, because the same guys are coming up with uh, and, and spending this money. And this is supposed to be a feeder class. And in their world, it's not a feeder class. They should be running first every night. But you got to stay, stay strong to that stuff, especially in, in, in my world, what happened in the, the, the top three divisions. But you have to distinct between the, the big events and, and have back gate events. At Leonardville, we have our World of Outlaws events. But I created, I created an event, um, Tom and I uh, created this event in Peavley, Missouri called the Dirt Car Roundup. Um, it's been 10 years now. And it didn't work real well there because of the situations and the, and, and the, the, the diversity between the classes. But I brought that event to Lernerville, and it, it's bigger than any uh, uh, outlaw race we have there financially every year. And it's a backgate driven prog program. We have nine divisions. And it's about the end of the year, having fun, and racers getting to race on a good racetrack, and people that's, that don't normally get to race there. And a fair purse. Uh, I mean, uh, our, our biggest purse to win is 3000 to win on those top classes, but 1000 to win on the next three, and then 500 to win on that. And I've I got to figure a way to build more pits next year, because I can't get enough cars in the thing. So um, there is, there's a place for both in, the, in my world. And I think, I, I know Dan... Uh, does the same thing at Lucas Oil, and, and Brett sees different stuff all over the country, but um, there's definitely room for both, and you have to find an equal balance to, uh, to be successful. Dan? You know, we, you know our, our bread and butter is our 12 specials. That's where we, you know, if we're going to make money, those are the events we do it at. Brings in the most people, but they cost the most, too. You know, our Show Me 100 purse, for instance, is, you know, in a $170,000 range, but my weekly show um, is 14000 and we average about 118 cars. And I think a lot of the reason we do that um, is because we have good tech. Uh, we do sanction a few of the three of the four classes with other bodies. Uh, and those rules are a little, a little more tightly controlled. But I have a street stock class, basically an outlaw street stock class. The rule book is four pages. And these guys keep building these jig built cars and got 430s and it's 300 to win and I average 25 of them and everybody loves them. So there's no just about the time you think you really got to figure it out, it doesn't always work. A guy will pull in with a street sock, he's got a toter home and his family stays in there. And so you can't always save the racer from himself really is what it amounts to. And, you know, you could put rev limiters, you could do all these things and sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. Uh, as far as the tech, uh, we do tech very good. We do a lot of pre-tech. I always buy all the tools they need. I have a very good tech guy that doesn't play favorites. And you know when you come into our place, you're liable to get disqualified. So, you know, people have learned that we don't mess around and, and to get it right when you get there. And that def at least they know they're on a level playing field. That does help a lot. Brett, uh, these guys have maybe, what, 100, 150 racers that are there all, all the time. Uh, you've got 200 tracks times 100 to 150 racers each. I mean, one of the things that I've heard a lot from drivers that run your roll package at different tracks is, one, I can go race somewhere else if it rains out at my favorite track. But what they really like is that there's the stability of the rules, and they love your engine package. Well, we have 
you know, our niche in, in motorsports has been trying to keep the, the race cars as affordable as possible. You know, modern day IMCA, as I call it, basically since the late 70s, um, we're known for the IMCA modified division, um, you know, but we have seven other divisions of race cars as well that we offer racetracks that are willing to sanction with us. And, and we try to we try to offer all of which are what I would consider to be relatively affordable, but um, at the same time, racing is not really affordable. It's hard to promote it as such. <laughs> it's kind of a, it doesn't make sense. But um, you know, for each level, we try to we try to structure within IMCA different levels for the racers, give them the opportunity to spend different amounts and move to different divisions. So we, we kind of try to connect them and have a little bit of a game plan of how they all work together uh, for us as an association. You know, it's, there's a fine line there um, from a, from from our standpoint. You, you want the race cars to evolve. You want, you want the evolution of the sport and the evolution of the race cars to, to keep it relevant, to keep our racers excited about what they're building and what they're racing every weekend. You don't want them to think that they're, they're racing antiques. But from our standpoint, if we could keep them on an antique budget, that, that's what's best for us. So it's, it's a very difficult um, uh, set of circumstances and balance for us at IMCA to maintain. You know, this, this place is such a good example. Every, uh, what I usually tell people if they ask me if I'm coming to PRI or what it's like, for, for IMCA in particular, I usually try to, try to compare it as, I, I, I say I'm like the DEA. Imagine a big crack house full of, <laughs> full of um, junkies. And I, I'm the DEA, and I'm in the middle of a table there, and I've got all these junkies coming to us who are saying, hey, can we use this? Can we use this? And, you know, I'm saying, no, no, you can't have that. You can't do that. You shouldn't be doing that. Stay away from that stuff. <laughs> you know, so it's, I, I feel like at times we should have, like, a, you know, in our booth, we should just have a big pinata with IMCA logo, logo on a rope, and we just give racers bats, and they just come up and take a swing <laughs> at it. Because it, it can be very challenging for us to, to, to somewhat slow down the creativity and the evolution that a lot of these people out here are coming up with that's pretty cool that we'd like to at times allow, but at the same time, we, we know that if we allow it, we're going to take ourselves down a path that um, may not be good for our, our racers or our racetracks or us as, a, as an association. Okay, for these guys up on the stage, asphalt is just what you use to get to the racetrack. But we did see a classic example. Uh, in fact, we see a classic example the first weekend in December every year uh, what can happen when you might go too far with technical inspection. Ricky Brooks at the Snowball Derby is one of the best in the business. But I sometimes wonder, and I'm going to throw this off, out as a toss-up uh, toss question to you, can you go too far on tech, or as long as you can stay consistent, is, is that good? I mean, can you really go too far with tech? How can you compare that to what we do? I think what was the infraction? Too much left side weight. Yeah, it, yeah. it's it's something that we don't even. Uh, gosh, it, it's it's part of our world. That's that's what we let our guys do to to get that to get that advantage. And uh, as long as they're safe, that's that's. I think that's our biggest point. Is uh, but uh, yeah, that definitely was a a, a situation. You know, the only problem I have with that is you know the winner's not the winner. It wasn't like they found a, a bolted on part that was illegal. This is 300 laps of racing and fuel burn off and different things. And, and now his left side weight's just a little too much. So, you know, maybe the fault lies with the racer. He knew where the safety was. They pushed the envelope and that does happen. Um, but, but that's where the fine line is. People stood there and watched that whole race and the guy crossed the finish line first in a car that was really, really, really close to being legal. But by this much, it wasn't. So that's what's the hard pill to swallow for me. Everybody likes Chase Elliott. <laughs> we like Christopher Bell. Yeah, I'll say, how about the dirt guy winning the race? <laughs> okay, before I throw it out to the, to the, uh, the class here, uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. Brett, you're coming. Oh, um, it's challenging. It's from our standpoint, it's very challenging. You know, it's easy to write race car rules that maybe myself or the, the handful of staff members that we have working at IMCA that do nothing but inspect race cars, it's easy for us to write rules for, for us to, to understand and for them to enforce. What becomes difficult and challenging is for you to expect a racetrack that's franchised or sanctioned with you 
to have a, a local guy who's doing it part-time for fun or getting paid maybe 50 bucks a night to be able to understand those rules and effectively enforce it. And if you aren't careful, you write rules that require um, extensive amounts of equipment or expensive equipment or very knowledgeable people to be able to run it. So from our standpoint at IMCA, we just try to keep it really, really simple as much as we can. And that seems to, to work very well for us. Uh, David ba David Vaughn, Baylands Raceway Park, Fremont, California. Uh, I'm curious about what business we're in, in the Saturday night circle track world. I mean, long, long time ago, people got paid to put on a show and they got 40% of the gate. Today, with all the revenue streams going to the racetrack or promoter, if they're not the same, the track guys basically, from what I can tell, are following the road racing example. It's basically pay to play. Why do we call it a show? Why don't we just charge them, give them a venue and let them play and exercise the rules. That's the question. Is that the business you're in other than special events? And back gates with 300 cars is a huge economic deal. Is that the business we're in instead of entertainment? I think we're in all those businesses. And that, that's how we have to be successful in a deal. You have to find your niche um, it, with the entertainment side of it. I have, I have some events that entertainment is, is the top uh, is the top of the game, but I also have other events where the racing is the top of the game. But uh, you have to find that niche to, f to to bring that all together. You have to have a little bit of everything. Yeah, I agree. You know, the pay to play thing is you know that is a great business model if you can get people to do it, and we do that a lot on our lake. Um, our track, we do you know as a circle track, dirt track. No, we try not to do that. We try to pay a fair purse. Obviously, a, a weekly racer coming with a $25,000 street stock to make 300 If he wins a couple times a year, that business model makes no sense, but he has fun doing it. So, um, But the, I understand the pay to play, and I think there's a place for it, so it's kind of a fine balance. I still think, I think there's a great deal of entertainment value in circle track dirt racing. So, yeah, I think that um, some, some racetracks rely on the back gate. Um, but we have, you know, we have racetracks that, that don't rely on the back gate. They rely on the front gate. gate. So, I mean, we, but we sanction so many different facilities, and, and, you know, there's no two facilities are the same. No, their models aren't exactly the same on how they're running their racetrack, you know. But, I, again, I think that the, the, the entertainment value is there in auto racing um, to the point to where, obviously, people still want to pay and come watch it, and, and we're able to make it work from, from the front gate side of things. Um, as much or uh, more so than the back gate too. And the market makes a difference, I think, in where you're at and in the area you're at. Every, every market is different across the, no matter what, the 250 racetracks you have, every market has a little niche to it. Hi, I'm Greg with PRI Magazine. I want to talk about cost containment, specifically engines, and how you all integrate specialty build engines, crate engines, and in the case of IMCA, the claimer engine rule that was in effect for many, many years. Yeah, we, we, you know, IMCA, again, modern day IMCA was built on the philosophy of trying to, you know, control the costs. And we did it very effectively for a couple of decades with the engine claim rule itself to where, you know, we, we had some core rules that made sense um, to, to keep in place that were easy to inspect. But then when it, w when, the, when it was all said and done, what controlled the costs were whether or not the racer was willing to sell it at the end of the night to somebody um, fifth on back. And, and, you know, it built, I think that particular rule was a, was, a, was a very instrumental in building the volume of IMCA modifieds or modifieds in general across the United States. We've, we've employed that claim rule into, into other divisions very effectively as well, but, you know, it, it has its place. It, and, it, it, you know, it's not an easy rule to, to, uh, to implement. It, it, you know, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, but at times it don't make sense. Um, so we shifted a little bit. We shifted um, 10 years ago, well, 12 years ago when GM came out with the, the crate engine. We took a look at that uh, after the first year, and then we tested it the second, and, and, and we put it into our uh, sport mod division primarily at that point in time. And we gave our racers an option out of the claim to opt out. You know, we knew it was a, it was a production line assembly engine, so we knew it was being built by one, one company, um, all the same. Um, so it, it made sense, you know, the seals on it and whatnot, you know, the techable aspects of it, it covered all of that as well, and the price was right. So it kind of fit into, into our uh, game plan on, on our approach to engine rules, and, and we implemented it, and it has been extremely popular. 
um, for a variety of reasons. I think for all the reasons we touch, that I touched on, but also um, just as much, you know, given the racer and out to the motor claim and having to sell their engine at the end of the night for 325 bucks. I think uh, my deal on the uh, on on the on the motor side of it. Uh, I've sat through World of Outlaw Sprint Car meetings for the last ten years about how we're going to make these motors cheaper, and uh, tube sizes, injection. I mean, everything that's been brought up are all great ideas, but they're still outlaw sprint cars. And I think what what uh, World Racing Group and Brett and them have, have done is made a big gap between that and the crate motor programs and that kind of stuff. So we have the $55,000 engines. These guys are doing this for a living, but the middle of that gap is gone. Is starting to go away. You're either, you're either at the top or you're at a feeder class and having fun with it, and that's where the, the crate motor program comes into play. I mean, a, a new sprint car engine out of, uh, out of Kissler is $56,000. Crate motor is $5,700 for a 604. I think that middle, the middle of the road is, is gone away, and I really think that's good because the feeder classes let those people shine into the, to, to build to that. I don't think we're ever going to stop the big stuff, but the feeder classes with, uh, with the, uh, the crate motors is a, is a great program. The one thing I've seen, too, and I think you have to watch a little bit, is, you know, anytime you mention the word spec of some sort and see what the crate, yes, you can buy a crate motor for 5700 and no offense to what you at the IMCA, but I was at Des Moines last week, and there was a crate motor for 11000 that's legal, but because it doesn't make a lot of horsepower, you can't work on the inside, the guys with the money are going to go buy the trick carburetors that's still legal and the trick plug wires and, you know, those sorts of things, so... Um, even whether it be shocks or motors or anything, if you put the word spec on a lot of times, the top guys are still going to have an advantage. And what I've seen is the guys that are good and have the most money are still going to win the most races and win the championships. It, it's all relative. It will save everybody money. Certain things like Brett's this race saver IMCA sprint car is an unbelievable deal. It took years and years to develop, but that's one thing I've seen that's really been awesome. That's going to save a lot of sprint car drivers in this country so they can still race. It doesn't matter if it's the motor claim or the crate engine or what engine, spec engines, whatever it is. You're never going to be able to stop a guy who's got $20,000 in his pocket to spend it if he wants to. All we've ever tried to do at IMCA is limit the advantages that that money will get him. Uh, and the crate motor or the claim, you know, the claim rule itself, obviously, it, it was very effective at that. The claim especially because, you know, at the end of the night, you know, people will always ask, you know, how much, how much are guys spending on an IMCA modified engine? You know, and some of them are spending, you know, thousand dollars some of them might be spending fifteen thousand dollars but like i always used to tell them when the claim was much more prevalent at the end of the night it's only worth 325 dollars so it doesn't matter what he spent um and the crate engine to a certain extent it falls into that as well there's some perception out there that, that you can take a crate engine and and it's five thousand dollars off the shelf but it's actually a fifteen thousand dollar engine i don't necessarily personally buy that i don't think the bolt-on components that that racer is can buy that are giving him the advantages that um he may have got if he was under a claim engine rule rules where he was actually spending 15 grand versus a guy that's only spending a thousand i don't i don't think the bolt-on components can can make a can make a crate engine matter so much more um I just think it's the. I think the parameters are so tight, and we're racing on dirt, and there's so many you know, so many uh, opportunities for them to make errors and racetrack conditions and all that other stuff. That I just think that it's about as you know, from a from a technical like a spec engine type standpoint, the crate engine um, really hit the mark in my opinion. Yeah, we 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 dynoed a crate motor right out of the box and dynoed one that was w that was freshened or built or whatever blueprinted or whatever they want to call it. There's five horsepower difference. I mean that that that's. I mean, so if a guy wants line. to spend ten grand more to get five more horsepower, what's it matter? Yeah, you're not going to stop that anyway. But it's still the guy that's buying the fifty-seven hundred dollar one is going to be competitive with that guy. So all that matters at the end of the night is if that guy who only spent five grand wins every once in a while. And in IMCA, maybe it's because we have the volume of racers that we do. They're still winning. You still got guys that are that are that are low budget guys with used race cars and buying used crate motors or building their own claimer engine and winning races. And that's really all that matters. What challenges are you guys facing uh, in the short track world to a repopulate your your field, your back eight, and, and not only that, but to you know what are you seeing as far as the demographic uh, of your uh, uh, of your participant base, especially when we're talking about the the sportsman level and lower. 
Uh, we, you know, we don't have any, in IMCA, we don't have any uh, divisions that are smaller than a full-size car, basically. I mean, so we don't have any karting, any um, micro sprints, or any, any of those kinds of things. So, but we have, over the last couple of years, lowered our age, our minimum age requirements. It used to be you couldn't race in IMCA until you were 16. We actually lowered it a few years back to where we're at 14. Um, for us, you know, we again, we deal with such a volume of, of racers. We had 9,120 different competitors competing in IMCA this year alone. They aren't all 40 years old. You know, there are a, a lot of racers, especially in what we call our sport compact division, front wheel drive car, our most economical class. That's where our youngest racers are tending to migrate is to the stuff that's the cheapest. We're seeing them in sport compacts and we're seeing them in sport mods, which generally speaking are are um, most least ex you know the least expensive divisions and and you know our average you know we're having we're having 14 year old 15 year old 16 year old kids win um, you know our, some of our biggest races we're having them win you know obviously um, track championships uh, regional championships this year um, and almost national championships so and not only not only the, not only the age, but you know, within IMCA, we've got uh, many women that are racing in IMCA now. I know that was a little bit of a topic in the last session, um, women in motorsports. But we had ten track championships this year alone, won by women in IMCA. Two state championships, win won by women, and one special series won by women. So, and and IMCA in general, um, for the last well since 1990, has been uh, managed and run by a woman, my mother. So. There are women in racing that are very successful. IMCA was run, and you know, again, I, we're the largest association of our kind in the United States, and, and my mother, Kathy, ran it since 1990. Okay, Gary, I'm going to throw this uh, last question out at you to start. And you notice I got as far away from Tom Deary as I could, so he can't throw anything at me, and I think I have a poll between us as well. Years ago, when I went to the... Uh, the sprint car race is out at Las Vegas. Gorgeous facility. Track prep was lousy. <laughs> now you go out to Las Vegas and the track prep is amazing. What's the secret to success of a good track prep for a dirt track? Well, I'll get through this to Brett Root because he was my uh, he was my fire extinguisher guy here for the duel in the desert. There, we've had some we we had some issues this year with the duel in the desert with the uh, with the IMCA cars, and we were just talking about this earlier. With uh, it really makes a difference with uh, what you're running on the on the surface. And, and Las Vegas Motor Speedway runs two events a year, and I'm involved in two of them, and Brett's involved in one, and and uh, it's a real challenge. It, it really is. Uh, uh, you can be a hero or you could be a zero, and as Tom Deary told me in the, in the lobby earlier, he said, boy, you must have got lucky the first couple of years you are there. But um, it's, it's a great facility, but it, it doesn't stop. Uh, you have to have hard work. You know, there's no magic potion. There's no, uh, you, you just, it's how you deal with the situations and how you work through it. Uh, Brett and I really worked hand in hand together the last two years out there to try and make things better, and, and we're going to continue to do that, so. Dan, um racers love your facility and they say it's because one of the reasons is because they can kind of count on what they're going to get there pretty consistent what's the secret well it hasn't always been like that that was always one of the early downfalls of our racetrack honestly is we had this beautiful facility and and the racetrack wasn't very good and so we kind of took a lot of rap for that so over the years we we've tried different dirt different methods different people and and lately Last few years, we've got it pretty solid. You know, every car, like I said, every car is having a sprint car. Track is completely different than what I do on Saturday night. My Saturday night guys, they want a smooth, slick, slow track, easy on equipment, don't tear up. And people come to watch sprint cars, they want to see them go fast. So so that is different. We really just work very hard to try to keep it consistent. Uh, we're, we're lucky to have a lot of equipment with Lucas Oil, so that's a built-in advantage I have. If we need, If we miss it early, we can go till it. Uh, water it we can do whatever we need to do and but we really have put great emphasis to get it a good racing surface because at the end of the day that's what people go home remember how great the feature was again speaking to my favorite little short track out in my way not the diss sycamore because they have good, great racing there too but LaSalle with the the hell tour that comes there the racing is always consistently good they run other rules there and it's real hit or miss when they ran the IMCA rules last summer. They either got very lucky or your rule package, it, it, it helped. I, I think it helps. 
I, I yeah, obviously I don't agree with that, but <laughs> I, um, we're in dirt track racing, you know. So the one thing that dirt track facilities have to offer, the one thing they have to have right, in my opinion, is the racetrack. You can't put race cars out there on crap, to be quite honest. Um, you know, I, I'd like to follow, you know, where we have the Super Nationals, Robert Lawton's, Robert Lawton's golden rule for everything is, is the racetrack has to be right. That is the one thing that can kill a racetrack, a dirt racetrack, is a, is a poor surface, a poor racetrack. It, you have all kinds of issues that it creates from issues with the racers, you know, complaining about the surface or holes or whatever it may be, to not only the issues that it creates for the grandstands, whether it be dust bombing your, your fans, um, or just putting on a, p a poor quality of racing. So, you know, the racetrack to me is, n is number one issue. If you want to run a, a dirt racetrack, the first thing you got to do and do it right is get the racetrack surface right. Everything else generally can, can be built on from that. But it's hard to get everybody to come in there and then and put them out there and watch for a freight train race or to watch, um, you know, to get just du dust bombed and the, all the wives want to leave or whatever it may be. So... The surface is the key when it comes to dirt racetracks, in my opinion. And you don't want a lot of dirt on your hot dog, so that's always a problem with me. Gary, wrap us up. You know, uh, I guess I'm the track prep guru of, the, of this deal, and uh, you know, we we just talked a little bit about that. But the surface is very important to uh, have a good base for that. But sometimes the weather and uh, Mother Nature is is your your friend, and sometimes it's against you. You know, at World Finals at Charlotte this year, we had uh, seven and a half days of rain. Uh, and we, we actually did world finals with a half a load of water. And uh, sometimes it got you and sometimes you got it. It's just how you manage it. And it's nothing, there's no, there's no special potion. I, I've, I've tried some, some, some different uh, additives and stuff like that. And I have a good product that I've been working with lately. But there's nothing, there's no, there's no substitution for hard work. Uh, and having the guys that, that put the hours in. At Volusia, we, want, we run 12 nights straight, and my guys work from 8, 9 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the morning every night, and I don't know how they do it. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, there's nothing, you can't, it, it's hard work. And the people that think that they can get to the racetrack and open it up on Saturday morning, throw a couple loads of water on and go racing, you're, you're out of control. You got to have, you got to invest, as the, the, the panel said earlier, you got to invest in people that, that know what they're doing and you and that's where you need to invest in your racetrack first is making sure you have that great surface dan your final comments please you know kind of as an overview you know when it comes to whether it be circle track racing or drag racing it doesn't matter what it is this particular topic is oval track racing but um basically to me every every track every region every location uh, is different and you have to do what works for you uh the, the biggest thing i try to do is you know balance and moderation just keep people you know, keep it diverse, keep it fun. Um, one of the early topics we, we didn't get to, but, you know, the customer experience, that's the thing. We don't just race at Lucas Oil Speedway. You know, we have bounce houses, and we, we blare the music, and we shoot T-shirts, and uh, we have a, a basketball court, and we have a fishing pond, and we always have attractions on the midway and those sorts of things. So, you know, that's what works for us. Uh, a track that's a back eight track in a small town that just runs weekly racing may not have all that stuff, but then he's got to keep the show cheap, keep the ticket prices cheap, and put on good racing. So, again, it's just all on your, your situation is what matters, and you just got to do what works for you. Brett? Yeah, over tra oval track racing in general across the United States, I think, is alive and well. Um, obviously, the well part can be debate debated depending on which promoter you talk to but it's the entertainment industry and it's a very challenging time i think for for anybody in the entertainment industry no matter what the the, the venue is or what the what the sporting event is or whatnot so you know the the promoters that are savvy that are that are doing a good job at, at knowing what they have to offer and and providing the best they possibly can i think are, are doing okay you know and, and you know obviously there's hundreds of dirt racetracks across the united states uh, at imca we're fortunate to to be associated with with a lot of them and and they we see a lot of good things um a lot of big crowds at places a lot of big car counts at places and um there's a lot of positive things that are going on i think the i think right now in society in general there's a lot of negative stuff people want to focus on the negative especially when you get into social media and the you know the, and the racers and the, the fans or anybody in general willing to just unload on on people that they don't agree with but there's a lot of positives out there in the sport and a lot of positives that I think um, can be drawn um, for the industry in general that, that obviously that IMCA is in. These might be the dirt track dudes, but everybody, whether you're a circle track guy on asphalt, 
whether you're a drag racer, whether you're a road course racer, I think you can learn from the dirt track industry that they really get this concept that we're not in the racing business, we're in the entertainment business. You go to a dirt track and you're going to be entertained. They put on a show, whether it's the, the World of Outlaws or whether it's IMCA, um, they understand that I think better than some of the other uh, parts of the industry sometimes do. What have we learned today? Oh, quite a bit. Uh, track prep, I learned that there is no secret formula other than hard work, having good people involved, and then getting lucky with Mother Nature from time to time as well. When it comes to rules, um, back in the day when I was uh, announcing some asphalt racing, right after the race in technical inspection, I had a guy come up to me and says, I got a scoop for you. That winning car, they cheated. I said, how do you know that they cheated? He says, I built his shocks for him, and I know they're illegal. And I said to the guy, so you were just upset because he cheated better with your cheated out product? And that ended the conversation. But rules cost money, but not enough rules cost money too. We learned that. And I love this concept of you're not going to save racers from themselves. So try to minimize what advantage that extra money will give them with some smart rules indeed. And I love the idea of hangover events. That is a great idea because I see so many tracks where I go out for a health tour event again at LaSalle and the place is packed and it's rocking and Tony puts off the fireworks and everybody's happy. And then two weeks later, he runs a local show and everybody's worn out and they don't come back. But he found a way with a $5 night on a Sunday night. Nobody's got anything to do on a Sunday evening. He starts the racing early, gets them out of there on time so they can be to work on Monday. And that's worked good for him. But I love this idea of finding a way to keep your fans coming back for the regular show when you've sold them on the big event. So with that, I want to uh, thank our Oval Tracks panel. Give them a round of applause.